Welcome to the final episode of the BCNR Iceberg Explained video. Without further ado, let's get into it. It used to be the absolute pinnacle of British engineering. Birdsong. Birdsong was the original title of Ants From Up There, as revealed in this Instagram post by Charlie. I have no idea what it means. Maybe some kind of reference to Concord? Either way, I think Ants From Up There works much better as a title. Hidden Engravings According to some people on Reddit, the vinyls of both For the First Time and Ants From Up There have hidden engravings on them. The Ants vinyl has the four seasons etched on all four sides of the double album, while For the First Time has the first two lines of lyrics from the song All the Tired Horses by Bob Dylan on each side. That song doesn't even feature Dylan on vocals, but the lyrics are pretty cool, I guess. Unfortunately, I don't own either of those records, so I can't actually show you them, which kind of sucks. For the first time, USB stick. In the marketing for For the First Time, the USB was sold on the band's website as a sort of pre-order thing for the album, and featured photos and videos of the band recording the album. The USB also featured recordings of their first rehearsals following the breakup of Nervous Conditions, including the song's instrumental and opus. I would do anything to get my hands on that. Unfortunately, it isn't available anymore. However, the gods at the BCNR Discord have done the Lord's work by uploading the USB files onto a drive. Bart the Art Guy According to the interview Lewis and Tyler did with the Mellow Man himself, the stock photo cover of For the First Time came from a random American guy named Bart they met in the Houston underpass. This is one of the strangest stories relating to BCNR, with the band often being mysterious about who exactly this random guy is. Apparently, he was just their art director for a while and then left before Ants. If I were to guess, there's probably some legal stuff going on that we probably don't know about, and we probably will never know about. There's just not that much information on it. Isaac Wets the Bed Isaac Wets the Bed is a kind of alternative title to basketball shoes. Isaac told a fan that he could call the song Isaac Wets the Bed after the very performance of it, most likely due to the not-so-subtle lyrics about his bedsheets being wet. Luke holds his guitar funny when he's not playing. Luke hugs his guitar when he's not playing. It's very funny and cute. I would say more, but I think this tweet from Mr. Greep sums it up best. Bush Hall Music Videos Following the release of Live at Bush Hall, the band released the performance of Upsong as a separate music video, calling it the official video for Upsong, and then proceeded to remove it a couple of hours later. No idea why this happened, but from what I remember from the video, it was just a Bush Hall performance with what I think were Japanese translations of the lyrics on the right hand of the screen. Happy Bagel Klezmer Orchestra Georgia played violin in a jazz-influenced klezmer group called the Happy Bagel Klezmer Orchestra, their self-titled debut album, Bangs. Ugly, another windmill scene band that Charlie played drums for for a while. Their sound is more funky and indie rock sounding than the sound the windmill scene is usually associated with, and as a result, it is a lot less abrasive as well. Their song Switch is pretty good. Full Screen Productions Lewis's YouTube channel, I think? We release his shitpost videos of him, Luke, and Jordy from Black Midi. There's only three videos on the channel as of now, two of them being Lewis, Luke, and Jordy goofing around. There's also a weird parodic Simpsons top 10 list narrated by Lewis on the channel as well. Check it out if you want to see Greep's excellent cinematography. Their newest video where they unbox the PS5 is a highlight. East Cam's Massive if you've been a fan of BCNR for a while, you've probably seen this video show up in your recommended feed. It's a video of a blonde-haired, teenage Isaac performing skate tricks in an unspecified city with his friends. It also features him being a bad boy by smoking a cigar. Now, I don't know a lot about skating, but Jesus, Isaac is actually a really sick skater. I could never imagine doing some of the stuff he does in that video. It's really quite bizarre watching Isaac doing maybe the most non-Isaac thing imaginable, especially with the context of his lyrics. However, the story isn't quite finished there. The YouTube channel that uploaded the video, East Cam's Massive, is a self-described skateboarding crew from East Cambridge, UK, explaining their name. If you scroll down to some of their first videos, released more than 10 years ago, you will find this. It's only bloody Luke also doing things on a skateboard that would break my legs if I ever tried to do it. 
There's actually a couple of videos of Luke doing tricks on the skateboard, including this completely convincing Ollie. I'll link the channel below so you can gawk at his sick tricks. Bait. Bait is a 2019 film directed by Mark Jenkins about a fisherman in a Cornish village. The only reason this is relevant is because Georgia plays one of the characters, Katie Lee. You might be curious to know what the film is actually about. So was I, but there isn't really a great synopsis anywhere on the internet. So I spent an hour and a half of my day watching a British art film for a video about the band BCNR. Just kidding, there's no way I would do that. Based on a few synopses that I could find online, the movie seems to be about a fisherman named Martin who slowly sees his picturesque Cornish fishing town become a gentrified tourist spot, but I can't seem to find much more. As a side note, I did actually try and watch this for a little while, but as you can probably guess... But I was so bored, I was so fucking bored. Childhood Drawings In the promotional material for Ants From Up There, and I think even for tour announcements and stuff like that, the BCNR Twitter account would post childhood drawings done by the band members, along with these announcements. As you might expect, all of the drawings are unparalleled masterpieces that should be hung in the Louvre. Here are just some of them. No joke, this drawing from Tyler would actually make a pretty sick album cover. Jokes aside, it is really heartwarming to see the band able to reminisce about their past and really capture the feeling of hope that is all over Ants From Up There and Bush Hall. On the subject of these drawings, Tyler said, quote, We've been through a lot together, and no matter how old you are, you think back to being a child. It's such a pure and hopeful time. A childhood drawing is the truest representation of who you were. That's how we feel about this whole album. It has this overwhelming sense of hope and light. End quote. Look at what we did together, BC and all friends forever. Charlie's Puffin Calendar. At the start of every month, Charlie posts a photo of his calendar on Twitter, which each month having a unique puffin picture. I think his mom gave it to him. It's amazing. BC and R are fascists. A reverence to a since deleted joke comment made in one of the BC and R comment boxes on RYM. As much as it is a shit post, this is hilarious. Quote, BC and R are Brexit supporters. Mr. BC and R is a bojo maniac, and so are rest of the band. Plus, they write white supremacist songs, and their band name too. Britain is becoming a black country. BCNR don't like that. They advocate for a new road for white people. This is why Brexit rock is ruining music. End quote. Duxford Air Museum. According to this interview, the inspiration for Ants From Up There, specifically the lyrical theme of Concord, came from their shared childhood experience of visiting the Duxford Air Museum in Cambridge, where all of them except Georgia grew up. I think that this reflection on shared childhood memories is really beautiful in solidifying the concrete bond that every single member of the band has with each other, and is also related to the theme of putting childhood drawings as part of the promotional material. Twitch account. Around early 2021, during the release of For the First Time, BCNR seemingly had an active Twitch account where they played a few horror games, did a bit of GeoGuessr, and read RYM comments, plus some other stuff that has since been lost to time. I say that as only two short clips exist on the internet right now, with all of the VODs having been deleted off the face of the earth. What we have though is truly magnificent content. I'd like to particularly highlight the horror game clip, not only for the fact that it's BCNR playing a horror game, but also for these monstrosities. God, what is FNAF there? Oh, uh, PewDiePie played that, I think. Whoa. Slint interview. Following the release of For the First Time, the Ninja Tune podcast, the podcast for the indie label that BCNR assigned to, released an episode featuring Luke and Isaac, as well as Britt Walford, the drummer from the band Slint. As mentioned earlier, the two bands have been compared to each other for some time and has but kind of become a meme. The interview also came with this picture, which I think we can agree is one of the greatest photographs of all time. When I first heard about this, I actually went a little bit insane from how crazy it was that two of my favorite bands were talking to each other, especially two bands that despite some similarities, come from two entirely different times and locations. Unfortunately, this is a boring mess. As much as I love these three musicians and everything they've done, making an engaging podcast episode is not exactly their strong suit. The episode is based around introducing a bunch of music that each band is into, and I did find some cool stuff in there, but for the high expectations I had, I was kind of let down. 
Dio in Georgia. Dio in Georgia is a YouTube channel featuring musical performances from Georgia and Theo Black from Dio around 15, 16 years old. They're a folky acoustic guitar and violin duo who wrote a lot of their own original songs and performed at community events in Cornwall where they grew up. They were also younger than me and are much more accomplished musicians than me, which makes me feel pretty bad. As you might expect, there's not exactly a treasure trove of information about this pretty short-lived act, but seemingly they were part of this band called The Contours, with a guy called Bryn Davies on double bass. I do find it interesting that you can clearly hear that Georgia is a really well-trained singer, and the way she uses her voice in some of these recordings is reminiscent of the way she sings on some jockstrap records. The YouTube channel has posted no new videos since April 2014, so I think it's fair to say that Georgia won't be giving up Jogstrap to return to this group anytime soon. Charlie's YouTube channel Charlie has a pretty inactive YouTube channel where he has posted a couple of drum covers from when he was a teenager. Turns out he's pretty good at the drums, who'd have thought? King Crimson Interview Charlie and the drummer for the prog rock band King Crimson since 1994, Pat Mastoletto, did an interview for the publication Words on Tape. Funnily enough, the guy who brought this interview to my attention on the BCNR Discord was the very guy who conducted this interview, which I thought was pretty sick. Speaking about the interview itself, it's honestly one of the most fun and laid-back interviews I've ever seen. It really just feels like a conversation between two friends who love music. That is probably helped by the fact that Charlie is probably the nicest human being to have ever lived on this earth. I highly recommend checking it out. Across the Pond Friend Meaning Although the meaning of the lyrics behind Across the Pond Friend seem pretty straightforward, something about a close but fleeting relationship with a companion from the US or some other foreign or at least very far place. At least that's how I thought of it. According to some of the things Lewis has said before performing this song at concerts, the song is either about Luke and the friendship he has with him, or it's some weird response to meeting Earl Sweatshirt in an elevator somewhere. I highly doubt that the latter explanation is true, because one, how does that have anything to do with the lyrics? And second, the show where he says that this is the origin, specifically Primavera Sound 2022, is not even the first performance of the song. The explanation during the Manchester show is far more plausible, because that at least talks about friendship. But I'm pretty sure Lewis and Luke live together, so the lyrics about planes and the title make absolutely no sense. I'm definitely reading way too much in a couple of stupid ad-libs by Lewis before a song, but I still found it interesting. Charlie Vogue Modeling Charlie modeled for Vogue sometime in 2018. The only mention I could find of this were two Instagram posts. He looked stashing, as always. Middle Names According to this edit on the credits page on the music website RYM, for the album By the Time I Get to Phoenix by Injury Reserve, specifically on the song Superman That, which features a sample from Athens, France. The middle names of five of the band members are listed. I have no idea where Isaac George Wood, Louis David Evans, or Georgia Elizabeth Ellery come from. RYM pages are not always reliable, but it does appear that Luke's middle name is Jay, based on his Instagram name. Perhaps the funniest name of them all, though, the Duke of Sussex-like name of Charlie Somerset Palethorpe Rain, was not confirmed until fairly recently, at least to my knowledge, when Lewis does a shadow of all the band members doing a recent show in Osaka. Lewis Sax Lessons Apparently Lewis used to have an email where he would give in-person saxophone lessons. I assume this has been discontinued, but hey, if you need a saxophone teacher and you happen to be at a BCNR gig, you know who to ask. Black Mini Tracksuits the music video for Concord features a bunch of custom-made green tracksuits, which seem to have been subsequently used by Black Midi in some promo shoots. You can Fuji see that Rock 2013. During the Fuji Rock Festival in Japan in 2013, Carl Hyde performed a set of material live. On the last song, a performance of the Underworld song 8-Ball, a 15-year-old Tyler Hyde joined her dad on stage to provide backing vocals. While there doesn't seem to be any footage of it, when BCNR played the song Dancers at the Fuji Rock Festival almost 10 years later, in 2022, Tyler, wait for it, cried during the performance, likely due to the memory of her performing on the exact same stage so many years ago with her father. Build your own answer on their plane. According to this Discord message here, some either early or exclusive editions of the Ants From Up There vinyl featured a guide on how to assemble your very own Ants From Up There plane. Pretty neat.
Pre-Bush Hall Q&A. Before the release of Live at Bush Hall on YouTube, the band seemingly did a live Q&A in which they answered silly questions before deleting it immediately afterwards. This video no longer exists. Also, the members of BCNR Discord have kindly informed me of two theater premieres of Live at Bush Hall. One in an unspecified venue in New York, and one at the Institute of Contemporary Arts in London, before the release of the video on YouTube. The intro to the New York premiere featured a band in Yankees caps, and ends with them parodically saying, I'm walking here. Unfortunately, that footage also seems to have disappeared from the face of the earth. The Big Prize In their most recent Reddit Ask Me Anything, BCNR have hinted at a track called The Big Prize that was apparently part of the For the First Time sessions, but never made it. Luke also hinted at the fact that The Big Prize is their best song, which inclines me to believe that this is again a massive shitpost about a song that doesn't actually exist. But if it actually is their best song, wow, LP3 is going to be amazing. Henry BCNR don't take themselves too seriously. From the title of Basketball Shoes literally referencing Charlie's Air Jordans, to Isaac's frankly hilarious three-minute pop culture referencing ramble and the start of Suggestions Bar, coincidentally the very first thing most people heard from BCNR. The band are jokesters at their heart. Despite this, there's an indisputable profundity found in Isaac's lyrics, especially on Ants From Up There, where the lyrics range from painstakingly bittersweet You already don't care. To near incomprehensibly inscrutable. But it is for this the God has gave us hope and There is perhaps no better display of Isaac's unique lyricism than Snow Globes, a song that I have heard many times, but still cannot really interpret the lyrics of. Quite a few people have tried to interpret Snow Globes' strange lyrical refrain, some more seriously than others. But the main question that BCNR fans have about the lyrics of the song is, who the hell is Henry? Now, I don't think I'm anywhere close to finding the answer to that question. And I'm honestly not even sure if there even is an answer to it, with the lyrics being almost impossibly enigmatic. But when you hear Isaac screaming for the 15th time that, while getting slowly swallowed up by the thunderous torrent of Charlie's manic drumming. Suddenly, there's nothing that sounds more profound or meaningful. You feel that it's important, that the protagonist of the song is desperately trying to hang on to something. But the lyrics are vague enough that you just can't put your finger on what it is exactly. Snow Globes' lyrics are fascinating to me, as they're vague and specific at the same time but not vague enough to the point where the listener is able to relate to the song, not specific enough for the lyrics to sound too esoteric or referential. Shifting back to the core of this inclusion, I will share a few interpretations of the song and the character of Henry, and then share my own frankly underdeveloped and vague interpretation of what Snow Globes means. The first interpretation, with quotation marks as you will see shortly, is by a YouTuber named Otto Nelson, his video is a very literal and detailed analysis of Snow Globes, as a narrative being told by Anne Boleyn about her husband Henry VIII and the separation from the Catholic Church, which, in all honesty, probably makes the most sense of any of the interpretations I've heard, at least in the literal sense of an interpretation. The references to a clamp, the Catholic Church, a shrine that doesn't look anything like Jesus, the English Church, the titular shaking of a snow globe, perhaps a reference to God and Henry's guilt at leaving the church, all point towards this interpretation. But it turns out this was a satirical video that was creating a joke analysis of the song. That left me feeling pretty embarrassed as that video pretty much formed my interpretation of the song for a while, and is even one of the interpretations found on Genius. The second interpretation of Snow Globes is by someone we already mentioned before, the man himself, Professor Skye. His video on the topic is less of an attempt to understand the story and more of an abstract interpretation of the themes of the song. He outlines a far more theoretical analysis, describing the lyric refrain as being distinctly Homerian, a stark reminder of the inevitability of fate and the inability of humans to fight against it. The shaking of the snow globes representing a higher power shifting our fates. He also states that the song is very intentionally left vague, 
and that there is no extremely deep meaning that you can find by cracking the code, so to speak. Another possible influence of snow globes is the poem Dream Song 29 by American poet John Berryman. Similar to snow globes, the short poem is enigmatic and also features a main character by the name of Henry. Whilst thematically, there aren't too many similarities, the spirit and poetic style feels incredibly reminiscent of each other. Who knows, maybe Isaac hasn't even heard of John Berryman. I certainly had him before researching this video, but it is kind of an interesting parallel. As for my own interpretation, I think I actually kind of sort of know who Henry is, but I don't think the answer to that is even very relevant. In Team from Failure Part 1, Isaac proclaims the line, Every girl that looks at pictures of happy meals, I'm sorry, Henry. Sound familiar? I'm pretty sure that the Henry in question here is Henry Spichowski from fellow windmill band HMLTD, which stands for Happy Meal Limited. However, that doesn't necessarily mean that the Henry in Snow Globes is Henry Spichowski, but rather that the callback is a reflection of Isaac himself. BC and R are known to be self-referential, and I think that Snow Globes might just be about Isaac's desperation about being in the band, how he's slowly losing his will to keep performing at such an intensity. Granted, almost none of the lyrics, aside from the final refrain, painted this as being the interpretation. But at the very least, the song is about losing control and feeling like you are powerless, something I imagine was very apparent during Isaac's final performances with the band. Despite BCNR's penchant for kind of being shit posters, Isaac's lyricism on this track is honestly fascinating to me. But I don't think we should try and analyze it too much. After all, what if Tyler just bought a really cool snow globe? Oh wait, this was supposed to be an iceberg video. And that's the BCNR iceberg, as of July 2023. Of course, BCNR are still an extremely young band. It's only been about four and a half years since their very first show as BCNR, and only a little bit more than two years since their debut album. So I expect there to be a hell of a lot more BCNR stuff in the future. It is anticipated that a new record may be in the works over the course of this year, but I won't speculate too much. So, I hope you enjoyed this video, thanks for watching, and goodbye.